Добре, че се видим. I'm so glad to see that many of you here tonight. Uh, we're not talk with any uh, political technical series. I'll give a short introduction um, in tonight's talk. Um, it is clear that much social utility of cloud computing rests on the scale of its hardware infrastructure. Were it not for the global distributed large scale data centers and virtualization software stacks that integrate them, the current operations of the largest internet companies would not be possible. Consider only the material and energy throughput this requires. While the clouds, and this is the point that our guest tonight will probably spend some time on, seems the lightest and most material of economies, a typical data center clusters upwards of 50,000 computers, consumes energy at a scale of a smaller town, and releases enormous amount of heat and carbon into the environment. The energy consumption of Google, Facebook, Microsoft, Apple, IBM, and Amazon's grids rank on par with small underdeveloped countries. In fact, Greenpeace has estimated that aggregate electricity demand of our digital infrastructure back in 2011 would have ranked sixth in the world among countries and that the digital infrastructure's energy consumption by 2017, so next year, would account for up to 12% of global energy consumption, most of it sourced from coal. So the great acceleration of computing depends directly on an ever-growing throughput of matter and energy, which have been salient features of what climatologists refer to as the great acceleration of the human impact on Earth's carrying capacities. According to the latest fifth assessment report of the UN Inter Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the computer models indicate that we are set on a course of globally lo global likely temperature rise by the year 2100 of 1 1.5 centigrades for all CO2 level scenarios and of 2.0 for most scenarios, even where the cumulative CO2 is kept at present level. This will result in the increased melting of polar ice sheets, change of the global water cycle, accompanied by extreme weather events, and an average global sea rise of up to 0.82 meters. For, for scenarios where no further emission cutting measures are undertaken, we are likely to see a temperature rise of up to 4.8 centigrades. Due to cumulative CO2, climate change will continue in the future, even after emissions have been reduced. We know that with the voluntary commitments by the world's governments in the aftermath of Paris Agreement, we are on the course well past two centigrade mark, uh, and that we have lived through the warmest year on record, measuring 1.5 centigrades already beyond the pre-industrial levels. All these changes have been catalyzed by the growing productivity of our technologies. In the Promethean worldview that continues to dominate our understanding of techno-science, technologies are regarded as the single most important factor in human development. Advances in health, lifespan, nutrition, housing, mobility, communication, education, and various aspects of material abundance are all personally attributed to scientific and technological <coughs> development much to the disregard of other factors such as political struggles, social institutions, language, or play, as Louis Mumford would have had it. It is against this background <coughs> that stands the work of our tonight's guest. Before I give him the word, I would just briefly like to introduce him. James is a writer, artist, publisher, and technologist, currently based in Athens, Greece. His work covers the intersection of literature, culture, and the network. His work has been shown in solo shows in the UK, US, and Germany, and Croatia as well, in Rijeka, in group shows worldwide, and commissioned by organizations including the Victoria and Albert Museum, the South Bank Center, the Photographer's Gallery, Art Angel, the Istanbul Design Biennale, the Oslo Architectural Triennale, and Grimarish 2012 European City of Culture. James has a master, master's degree from University College London, in computer science and cognitive science, 
specializing in lingu linguistics and artificial intelligence. <coughs> Please help me welcome James. Thank you, Tom, for that generous and not at all terrifying introduction. Um, <laughs> Thank you uh, all. Oh, thank you very much for having me here, and uh, thank you all very much for coming. Um, yeah, uh, I'm, I'm going through a phase of thinking about a lot of those things that were raised like quite deeply at the moment, and I'm going to talk about some things that um, that kind of I end us up in some quite dark places. I feel, um, but I'm trying to do so with a sense of interest and curiosity and. Um, Generally, not to completely bum everyone out, essentially, is quite important, I think, at times like this. So um, I hope you'll come with me on this. Um, I was going to talk a little bit about um, kind of a quick race through uh, some of my projects so you get a vague overview of what I do. Um, I was going to go a bit deeper into uh, one project that I undertook this year called the Cloud Index, uh, and then I was going to uh, ramble a bit at the end about where I see this work taking kind of my interests and maybe other people's interests as well. Um, and if you have, and then hopefully there'll be time for questions and discussion at the end, uh, but if there's anything during, please feel free to ask. Um, so yeah, to, to talk about a few works I've done, uh, this is all about me, for which I, it has to be, because this is the only way I know to talk about the things that I do. Uh, and I, I kind of, um, I've always found myself making things as a way of kind of explaining themselves back to myself. Um, I ended up in art slightly by accident by making things to kind of explain the internet and new technologies to myself and to other people. Uh, and I was, uh, this was a thing that I made when I was actually a publisher. Uh, so I used to be a, a literary editor publishing contemporary fiction. Um, and I like making books. Um, and I was interested in the crossover between um, the way in which we're building the internet as a way of kind of explaining knowledge back to ourselves, how we're understanding the world. And that's something that I'm trying to come back to and remember at the moment. This project was where I took um, a single uh, article on Wikipedia, the history of the Iraq war, which at that time was about seven years old on the English Wikipedia. Um, and I took the history of that article, which was every single edit made to that um, article because Wikipedia doesn't just allow anyone to edit, it also stores the entire history of that. Um, and using all of my publishing skills, I published it as a full size book, like an old style encyclopedia, three columns, tiny print, the full deal. And it still came out to be a kind of 12 volume encyclopedia scale, the history of a single article, uh, which is a really nice, kind of simple visualization of the amount of work that goes into one of these things. But also important because it, for me, emphasized that things that have possibly always been the case, like the fact that encyclopedias are always compendia of many people's knowledge, usually created by huge teams, um, that hasn't changed, but we can now see that, right? That process of argument, that form of historiography that's always been involved in creating these forms of knowledge is now there because we've chosen to design a technology, in the case of Wikipedia, that actually captures that information and allows us to see that process in action, which is potentially hopeful. Um, this is, um, so my work then kind of goes back and forth between physical stuff and digital stuff. Um, I did a whole bunch of work on drones, uh, which I'm now thoroughly sick of, but it seemed to be really important to like, get to understand these strange machines um, that seem to have ach as first achieved a huge military importance and now a kind of strange cultural presence. Um, I was mostly interested in the military side of these things. I was fascinated by the fact that this piece of technology permitted um, war to occur uh, in ways that wars hadn't occurred before and did the thing that all technologies do, which is kind of make a certain worldview kind of portable and mobile and in this case literally kind of weaponizable that you can take this worldview, you can build a machine that reifies that view of the world and then kind of send it off across borders and do stuff. So this was a work called Dronestagram where for <coughs> two and a half years I followed the reports of um, US drone strikes in undeclared wars, so in Pakistan, in the Yemen, in Somalia. Um, uh, a war that was going on for which there were no images um, uh, because they were, it was a covert war 
And it struck me as extraordinary that a, a war could be going on in this kind of media-saturated age in which we had no images. Um, and yet at the same time, we spent the last 20 years at the very least mapping the entire planet from space. And you can take out your phone and you can see through satellites. It's, it's like having a superpower. It's extraordinary. So I, I looped those things together and started taking these images from publicly available digital maps of the locations of drone strikes, matching them to the drone strike reports gathered by investigative journalists, and posting them back to social media, to Instagram, to Twitter, um, to Tumblr, to kind of close this loop between these military systems uh, and the social networks that we use every day, which all run on the same substrate. Right? They all emerge from the same place, and they're still utterly and totally connected. Um, and I also took those, these same kind of processes out into the streets. Um, this is from a series called The Drone Shadows, where um, I sketch out one-to-one -one, uh, outlines of military drones in public space. Um, this actually preceded the, the drone Instagram work, but um, it's an ongoing one. Um, and this started again just purely as like me trying to understand what these things were. Uh, the first one of these was about five years ago now which is sort of um, when, when they weren't such big news, the drones. Uh, the drone war hadn't really been acknowledged. Um, there wasn't a lot of information in the public domain about what these vehicles actually were. Um, and I was fascinated, again, by the fact that this thing could exist in the world and that we had so little access to it. And I was fascinated by the idea that I could never like, stand physically in front of one of these things and like, have a human physical relationship to one. Um, and so... Uh, we sketched one out in the street, just basically, for, at first, to get some idea of how big they were, because people didn't seem to have any idea. And the first thing that people always say when they see them is like, oh, I had no idea how big it was, which is a, a, a simple but very telling thing, and, and something quite powerful. Because what you're doing when you're sketching out a technology like this is you're sketching out the whole kind of array and network that that, that single object, which is really just like the pointy end, of a very large intelligence gathering military network. Uh, you're sketching out that whole thing. And it allows you to start getting your head around things that initially seem to be quite uh, diffuse and networked. Um, you know, you're this, this thing that is designed in so many ways to be invisible, both physically invisible, that flies at kind of 5,000 feet or 50,000 feet, so it's actually invisible to the eye, but also politically invisible. Um, small gestures can do a lot to kind of actually put that thing into a space in which it can be, in which it can be discussed. Um, this work also, I made a bunch of these, but then I also um, open sourced them and published the plans for them, such as they are, it's pretty simple. Uh, but you can download the like, instructions and plans for drawing various ones of these uh, on the web, which means that they've since subsequently uh, been shown elsewhere. Uh, people have just done them, sometimes they send me photos of them, sometimes they don't. Uh, which is fine, um, but they also take on like different meanings as well. So sometimes they're done as part of art festivals, but sometimes they're done as part of protests as well, uh, which is again all fine by me. Um, it's already. It's also about actually putting images. Actually, to go back to this one, putting images out there that actually change the kind of discussion around these things. It was really key. I could talk about the drone stuff endlessly. It's the last thing I'll say about it. Um, these images turned out to be very useful because before started making images like this, the, all the images of the drone strike were like images supplied by the US Navy uh, or Air Force of how cool their drones looked. Right? That was the stock image. And so by producing other artworks, these started to appear, actually again without anyone telling me, in the media as images of the drone war, uh, to which really kind of changed the way in which it was kind of discussed and thought about. But I really like this approach of taking uh, stuff and painting it out in the streets. Um, this is a, a thing called the Rainbow Plane. Um, if you've ever spent, this is back to my obsession of uh, digital maps, this uh, satellite seeing through your phone. Um, these Rainbow Planes, if you've ever spent half as much time as I have on Google Maps, just generally scanning around, you might have encountered them. Um, they're, um, they're artifacts of digital mapping. You'll find them near airports um, if you go looking for them. And um, what they are is what happens when uh, a, fast, a very fast moving object, as fast as a plane, is photographed by a satellite. Because satellites don't see like people see. 
they don't really see how we think of as seeing as even like cameras, even digital cameras see. They, they sense. Um, they have a bunch of different sensors that record in different frequencies, uh, which means they're capable of seeing more than humans do, right? They see in the visible spectrum in the red, green, and blue, but they also see deep into the ultraviolet and infrared. And I'm really interested in the way in which this kind of technological sensorium is different to the way humans see and how that changes the way that we understand the world. So the rainbow plane is like a moment when you get inside this way of seeing the world. It's, it's a glitch, but it's a, it's a glimpse of the system that underlies and produces that. It's a moment when we can kind of share some kind of way of seeing with machines. So I like to find examples of that happening, kind of, again, like the drone shadows are like this, bring those out into the world um, so that we can start to think about how technology changes the way we see and therefore kind of understand and think the world. Um, a couple of years ago, I did this project in London, which is um, uh, a very large helium balloon, uh, which I flew off the top of a building for three months over the course of the summer. Um, and this is one of those projects where, um, again, as I say, like thinking through what I was doing and, and how and why made me kind of question it. I would, like the drone projects, I've been very interested in surveillance for several years. Um, the processes of surveillance, who does it, why, why you do it, um, what we can do against it should we wish to. Um, and I flew this balloon, which is actually a, a balloon, it's a half balloon, half kite, it's a beautiful object, um, and it's about the size of a car. Um, and I wanted to use it to make my own aerial photography, um, <coughs> like the satellite images that I was shown before, which are often kind of very beautiful, but have this surveillance quality of looking from the sky, this kind of machine view. Um, and what was really interesting to me about this project is that I was doing it for a while um, and it didn't seem to bother anybody else, um, which really bothered me in turn because I wanted someone to come and tell me that I shouldn't really be doing this because I was surveilling people. And it turns out, particularly in London, which is where this was, no one cares about that stuff, right? Uh, it's, not, um, uh, it's not on their radar that this might be something that shouldn't be done, essentially. And I realised that in uh, some of my work, and in a lot of work, artistic work about surveillance in general, um, what we're doing is actually kind of perpetuating surveillance to some extent. We're normalising it. Um, by most, a lot of this work on surveillance essentially does more surveillance, um, which is not actually a very helpful way of addressing the issue. Uh, we're stuck in, and I'll come back to this later, um, we're stuck in this kind of binary of being kind of force for or against forms of surveillance, opacity versus transparency, these different states of the world which are kind of locked against each other and we're still trying to figure out how to get through. And that was a kind of um, a jerk for me to start not making images in that way, not reproducing the mechanics of these technologies, but try and think actually how they could be redeployed in other ways. We're nearly at the end of this huge rush through and I'll settle down to a story in a minute, but I just want to talk about a couple more projects. Um, this is a project called Citizen X, which is a piece of software you can download um, if you uh, go to citizenx.com, uh, which is a piece of software that tracks your browsing. Uh, this again is in response to a bunch of the revelations about surveillance, but not about the tracking part. Uh, this software will track your browsing, but I won't see any of it. It's entirely private. That was very important. But what it does is do something that um, actually surveillance agencies do, uh, which is construct a persona for you based on your browsing habits. Um, and in this case, that persona is based on your citizenship. So surveillance agencies have a set of rules which say who they can and can't surveil, and that's usually based on the citizenship of their own country. So the NSA is not supposed to surveil American citizens. Um, the way they do that uh, is they look at your browsing habits and they decide, based on that, are you an American citizen? Um, and that means your citizenship becomes a kind of percentage score, right? It becomes something that's actually fluctuating and changing all of the time. Um, and this, this seems to me an important thing to address and something that actually shouldn't just be decided by surveillance agencies, right? I have many, many issues with uh, citizenship regimes as they exist in the world today, and actually maybe we should be figuring out different ways of presenting ourselves um, that aren't just based on passports or, or where we were born and such such forth, and we probably shouldn't be leaving those to the surveillance agencies to 
um, to decide for us, we should be kind of investigating them ourselves. So with this tool you can see what a potential algorithmic citizenship would look like. Um, but you also see it that it's based very much on this, as Tom was saying, this uh, physical infrastructure of the internet. So it's based on where the physical locations of the websites you visit are. Because for several years I've been very interested in looking for these, um, this physicalness of the internet. Right? If, if there was something we could kind of point to and go, look, you think the internet is this kind of magical faraway digital place, wherever the U is, uh, but actually like it's real. It exists solidly inside uh, national boundaries, inside legal jurisdictions, uh, where data is stored has huge implications for, for the law and for human rights and for these kind of issues. Um, but I'm starting to actually, as I say again, step back from that kind of really materialistic or materialist um, focus on the physicality of the internet. And starting to think again about um, what it actually kind of means. I'm going to go into the story because it seems like a good point. Um, so this is a, a longer story about a project I did over the course of this year, a bit longer, looking at um, some of the history uh, of the internet, of computation, and particularly of where our kind of this this idea of the Promethean progress again that Tom mentioned, where it comes from, this idea that um, that if we just gather enough information, um, if we can work out how much data to gather and how to compute it. Uh, will build towards this kind of extraordinary idea of progress. And one of the places that I started looking at this was uh, in the history of weather prediction, um, which is very deeply tied to the history of computation. Um, weather prediction really kind of gets going in its modern sense uh, at the beginning of the 20th century. Um, this is um, one of my favourite uh, places to start that story, which is a book uh, published by a guy called Lewis Fry Richardson in 1922. Uh, called Weather Prediction by Numerical Process. Uh, he'd actually been working on it for quite a long time. Um, Richardson was a meteorologist uh, who worked at a weather observatory before the First World War. Uh, he was uh, Scottish. Uh, and he was also a Quaker, so he's a pacifist. And so when the war started, he joined up as a stretcher bearer. And he spent uh, six years on the Western Front fighting the First World War. Uh, and during that time, uh, he performed the first uh, numerical weather prediction. Uh, with a pen and pieces of paper. He took a single day's weather data uh, for uh, Central Europe um, and he spent about two years, day by day, working out, sometimes under shell fire, um, the actual process by which you could mathematically predict from one place to another um, what the weather would be like for a single day. And it took him about two years to do this. Uh, and it turned out he was broadly correct. Uh, like the maths worked, it just took him two years. Um, uh, and, and this book was the result. In this book, this is a painting by uh, Stephen Conlon from 1986, but it's a painting of what Richardson describes in that book, um, which is how he thought that his ideas for numerical calculation of the weather would, would, would go forward using computers. But of course, computers in 1922 still meant people. Um, so he envisioned this vast uh, dome in which a map of the world would be divided up into squares in which there'd be a hall full of people all frantically working at the calculations. Um, and there can be telegraph bringing in the news from elsewhere and, and all these kind of subsidiary offices and all this kind of hive of activity um, to, to, to perform what was the great kind of ideal for him was that at some point the, the prediction of the weather would move faster than the weather itself. Right? And this is what he kind of thought would, would take to obtain it. Um, and that, that idea that by dividing the world up into ever, ever smaller segments, gathering as much data as you possibly could about it, processing that data as quickly as possible, um, reaches its, its actual moment of possibility in the Second World War, uh, when we build uh, digital computers that are actually capable of doing data processing at this scale. Um, and weather prediction uh, was actually the job of the very first stored program computer um, the ENIAC, one of its jobs. Uh, and this was the program that first did it, um, which was run in, um, they actually, they started working on the weather prediction during the war, and it was too hard, so they used it to build atomic bombs instead. Um, but they, they, they eventually managed to do the first complete 24-hour forecast uh, in 1950, um, using this, this computer they built during the war, the ENIAC. 
Um, and, and the guy who built it, John von Neumann, or one of the guys who built it anyway, um, talked, knew about Richardson's work. And he looked at, it actually took them about three weeks because the computer kept breaking down. But he looked at um, this one day forecast they'd done for North America and he realized that if you took out all the time that the computer wasn't running, it actually completed the task in 23 and a half hours. So finally, in 1950, he wrote, like, Richardson's dream of computation faster than the weather itself had been realized. Um, and this is, this is the ENIAC. Um, uh, it's my favorite computer, basically. I always end up talking about the ENIAC because it's kind of amazing. It's first stored program computer, as I said. Um, uh, and there's, there's all sorts of interesting stories about the ENIAC. But the first thing to look at is just like the scale of the thing, right? Um, this was built in uh, the University of Pennsylvania between 43 and 47, and it took up like two rooms this size. Um, it filled the walls, it covered them, there were stacks of machinery everywhere. Uh, to work at it, you had to kind of work in and around it. Um, there's a beautiful statement by a guy who worked on it, uh, a mathematician called Harry Reid, who said, um, the, the amazing thing about the ENIAC was that it was a very personal computer. Nowadays, we think of a personal computer as like something you carry around with you, but the ENIAC was a computer that you lived inside. This was a kind of whole <laughs> structural thing, right? And I agree with him, except that I actually, I, I think that's not really what's happened. Rather, the computer has expanded until it now covers the entire surface of the planet and extends up into space through satellites, and that we're all actually still living inside this shell of computation, but it's, but it's expanded, and we don't see it anymore. Um, Reid also talked about how legible the ENIAC was, which I think is really key as well. Most of, lots of this is valves uh, and, and other bits and pieces that would light up as calculations were going on. Some of that was in the nature of the technology and some of it was deliberate so you knew which bits were working. And if you knew which calculation was being performed, you could literally stand in the room and like, follow the calculation through the various circuits to watch it happen. It was a legible process. And that legibility over time uh, has also decreased as, as, the, uh, as these processes have kind of become abstracted, as they disappeared behind glass, essentially. So it's much harder for us now to kind of see these things happening. As I said, uh, there's, a, there's a military history to these projects as well. This is uh, von Neumann together with Robert Oppenheimer, who also worked on the ENAC, who was also, of course, the head of the Manhattan Project and the development of the atomic bomb. The, these processes are, the computational processes are deeply intertwined, but also the idea behind them is deeply intertwined. Because the idea behind all of this is, as I said, that we gather data in order to build models of the world that allow us to predict it and therefore to control it. That he who has the most data has the most control. Uh, and a huge amount of that control comes out of this ability to, to predict based on past, past models built on huge, huge amounts of information. And that was the, that's the kind of military logic of data gathering and processing. And I was interested in the various ways in which weather, um, weather prediction also led to the kind of uh, entertainment of those ideas of kind of control over the system, um, <coughs> which led me into thinking about um, weather control, and particularly um, the ways in which you can generate weather. Um, this is... Um, I always forget this guy's name at this point of the talk. Um, Schaefer, Lewis Schaefer. My apologies, to Mr. Schaefer, who was a scientist at General Electric in New York. Um, he uh, was the first to develop cloud seeding. Um, he'd done work on uh, fog machines, smoke machines during the war, ways to generate smoke and fog. Um, but you had to do that basically by burning large amounts of oil. Uh, he wanted to make, was looking at ways in which you could actually affect weather on a far vaster scale, at huge scales. And he realized that um, through various experiments, this is one he was doing with his, uh, like a home freezer on the desk. Uh, so he had a freezer on the table like this um, with very cold air inside it. Um, and by uh, dropping <coughs> tiny amounts of certain substances into that, you could cause uh, all of the um, uh, water in the air to condense and fall as rain, or fall as snow and ice in this case. And he, they industrialized this process. And the, the, um, the substance that they used that turned out to be most effective uh, was silver iodide. 
um, which I think is just beautiful because silver iodide, as I'm sure you know, is also one of the early and most successful chemicals used in, in photography. Uh, and, and there's this connection for me between the desire to image, the creation of images through the application of uh, silver iodide to the photographic plate to, to fix the image, to the, the fixing of the weather that cloud seeding makes possible. This idea that we can that we can attain some kind of mastery over the environment by making images of it or by causing it to rain um, or, or to prevent hail or these kind of very large scale mastery. And, and this um, systems of weather control are still regarded as being slightly crackpot. Um, they are, but they are actually in kind of massive industrial use um, all over the world. This is um, China's uh, Bureau of Weather Management. Uh, which is a huge uh, government department with thousands of employees that uses um, silver iodide rocket launchers to uh, either, as I say, make the rain in drought conditions or to um, uh, prevent rain by making it fall elsewhere to prevent hail ruining crops and so on and so forth. Or for political purposes. They use this extensively during the Olympics in Beijing to keep the weather clear and they do that for kind of all large government parades and all this kind of stuff. So. Um, there is an existing program uh, to change the weather in various ways um, for, for kind of various purposes. And I wanted to take that history of computation and this history of weather to put them together to suggest what other uses we could put to this if we chose to. Um, I, do I explain this now? Yes, I've got to explain this now. Okay. Um, <laughs> and so this, this, this interest and obsession with um, computer vision and, and the way that computers see is increasingly an obsession with the way computers think and the way that they think differently to us. Um, so uh, it's important to understand that when a machine sees images, it doesn't see what we see. It sees information, it sees data. And, and the ways in which it sees that are becoming increasingly strange and opaque to us. Um, because we're starting to not really understand, in the way that we're building our technologies, what it is that machines are seeing. Um, because uh, this is the um, talking about um, this essentially. Did anyone see this, which Google released um, earlier this year? Um, so what's happening here is that Google trained, uh, and other people have also trained, uh, systems, machine learning systems that are not artificially intelligent, but are um, systems that can learn from large data sets. Uh, to uh, look at thousands, thousands, thousands of images so that it can look at this image and say, okay, I know that's a cat, right? But it doesn't see that it's a cat for the way in which we see it's a cat. Uh, it sees a cat because it has certain resemblances in the data to thousands and thousands of other images of cats that it's seen. Um, but how it makes that process, how it makes that um, decision is very hard to understand. So one of the things that they did was that they uh, ran imi blank images back through the network <coughs> or other images back through the network to say, what do you see in this image? And the neural network starts to output deeply strange things like this. This is an image of a, uh, a machine that's been trained to look for dogs, desperately trying to see a dog in an image of a, a man on the back of a horse. Um, uh, and the point is this, that, that these networks don't just see the world. Uh, they're capable of creating images as well. Um, this is um, the output of the system that I started to use for this project, which is called a deep convolutional generational adversarial network, um, which basically means you have two networks, two kind of um, smart machine learning networks that talk to each other, um, that uh, both try to generate and then recognize images, and basically train against each other uh, to try and see the world. Um, and these are this is the output of a network that was given like 5,000 pictures of bedrooms. And then it was asked to imagine new bedrooms. And these are all the outputs of that. So none of these rooms exist in the world. These are all the outputs of a machine that thinks it knows what bedrooms look like. And it's come out with these kind of things. Uh, so it's, capable, it's crucial to understand these things are capable of generating new images. And also that you can do very weird things within these networks. You can do kind of uh, addition and subtraction uh, for example, this is an example of a network where um, a network knows what smiling women look like. 
it looks, knows what non-smiling women looks like and knows what non-smiling men look like and based on that information it's capable of outputting new images of smiling men. Right? So you can actually do, you can ask questions of it that weren't in the original data set. That's the technical background to what I did with the weather project, um, which was to uh, take, um, again, my obsession with satellite images, to take eight years of weather data from the UK, uh, which was uh, 20,000 images, so several images a day, that showed um, what the weather looked like uh, over the UK. Um, and I also took uh, the same length of data, uh, thousands of data points for um, the UK's uh, polling data, voting intention for the EU referendum that we had back over this summer. So I looked over eight years how people said they were going to vote, and I showed all of that information um, to one of these networks. And I asked it to imagine uh, what the clouds should look like. These are all um, images of cloud formations over the UK, uh, like the bedrooms imagined by the machine, imagining new, uh, new uh, weather formations related to that voting data. As I said, you know, it, it's seen 16,000 weather images. It's had eight years of information about how people vote. And so I asked it to imagine what the weather would be like uh, if, if other outcomes occurred. And these were its, some of its many responses to the question of what will weather would look like if the entire uh, country decided to vote to remain within the EU or to leave the EU. Uh, and these are therefore the, um, the weather patterns that, should we wish, we could actually start using the cloud seeding technologies to generate in order to um, produce the political outcomes that we would like to see. What was sort of actually for me more interesting was um, not actually those extremes in the voting patterns, but actually like what happens when um, you move from positions of, you move within different kind of vectors within that possibility space, not just from like the extremes of, of, vote, of leaving and remaining, but you start to take things like the number of undecideds into account. Um, that you're actually moving through a huge possibility space in which people's opinions are changing and shifting all the time and the weather patterns um, shift with them. And so all of this was really my attempt to, um, to reject that materialist no notion of the cloud that I talked about before. Um, this, this idea that you can sort of explain the internet and social conditions and kind of everything if you only like get out a spade and dig up that cable and like be absolutely you know point out rigorously do the mapping get all the information to to be certain of the thing that you're talking about that we can somehow gain some kind of huge total mapping and understanding of the situation and at the end of it stand back and go there like i've given you an answer now you all have had your consciousnesses raised you'll understand now we're good um, because that doesn't seem to be working across many, many domains. And I actually want to return the cloud, this idea, both the network and everything around it, to a state of something else, a state actually of cloudiness, once again, of something that actually is disparate and diffuse and is not possible to map and understand fully in that way. And this seems to be a really, really important time to be doing that. Uh, because weird stuff is happening. Um, this is the um, this is the uh, Kurzweil's like accelerationist curve towards the <coughs> singularity. Um, that is also you know basically every other graph you ever see of ever, of anything that goes up and to the right. Uh, this idea that you know progress whatever it is it could be Moore's law, which is the law that says computational power doubles every eighteen months. Um, all, all these kind of things, but the, 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 there is this idea that, that, that progress and everything goes up and up like this, and it's in this case, in the case of Moore's law, in the case of industrial production, in the case of whatever else, it's tied to this increased amount of efficiency, increased produced through technology, the amount of data gathering, the amount of processing, the amount of kind of raw mechanical uh, and computational power behind stuff. Um, uh, but this is actually, in, in increasing number of cases, what these graphs look like. Uh, this is a, a graph of um, uh, drug discovery in the pharmacological industry against the amount of money put into it over the last several decades. Um, uh, and they've actually 
researchers looking at this have named this Arun's law, which is Moore's law backwards. Um, because what this graph and others like it show is that as we increase computational power, we're actually uh, discovering less and less. Uh, this is becoming an acknowledged process within uh, the uh, various kind of sciences. But, um, uh, the, but in, in the pharmacology, it, it's turned out to be a really big problem because they spent the last 50 years automating the medical uh, discovery process, which basically means instead of having small teams working on small molecules, looking around this kind of bit of the problem space, doing something over here, having a weird idea over here, they've reduced it to having huge, huge sets of chemicals in, in vast, literally in kind of huge stacks, automated stacks with robotic systems that pull out those things and test them and plug them together to basically brute force the entire kind of chemical problem space uh, in order to sort through for possible things. And this brute force approach of computation is starting to fail. Um, it's not uh, actually producing at scale the, um, uh, the results that everyone kind of thought it would. Um, and there's various kind of reasons for that, and there's, there's possibilities that we are just kind of uh, exhausting uh, what, what the chemicals can do, which seems kind of frankly unlikely, or that this, this actual way of understanding the world, um, tainted as it always going to be by kind of database bias, uh, by the, the problem of the kind of limited sets of information that we're working with, is, is simply a bad way to go about this. Um, my favourite example of, of that in another domain is in um, chess, um, which is, uh, this is the famous match in uh, 84, 88, um, when uh, Kasparov faced Deep Blue, the IBM computer uh, that was designed to beat him. Um, and this is a really interesting story about what happens when, uh, when, you, when you try and match up human and computer intelligence and understand the links between them. Because um, Kasparov was, possibly still is, the greatest human chess player. And we place chess on this kind of pedestal of understanding. It was this kind of highest human intelligent act. Um, and so it was this huge blow to our idea of what it meant to be human when Kasparov got beaten. And to be clear, he got beaten by a very stupid computer. It was just very, very powerful, right? So all it did was that it did deep, deep searches of the problem space. So it looked at the position on the board and it could think more moves ahead than a human could do just by thinking what would happen faster in all of these different scenarios. Um, that's, that's basically all it could do. Uh, but it was enough to beat a human at chess. Um, what's interesting about this story, though, is what Kasparov did, which is that um, he went away, uh, really angry, um, came back uh, the next year and started a tournament, a new tournament, with a new set of rules for chess called Advanced Chess. And in Advanced, advanced Chess is a game for human and computer teams. Um, and in Advanced Chess, the human players are allowed to use computers. And something really weird happens, which is that um, even now, computers much weaker than, or much less vast and power consumers, Deep Blue, will wipe the floor easily with the best human players in the world. But a decent human player, working with a not terribly powerful computer, will wipe the floor with the biggest supercomputer. That there are different ways of understanding the chess problem space, but also the world, that allow for something different to occur. And all kinds of weird and interesting things have been happening in chess because of that ever since. Um, that there's a possibility of kind of cooperation rather than um, opposition in these kind of problem solving tasks. But unfortunately it's getting kind of weirder than that. And this is when I should have brought in my little neural network talk from earlier. Um, so, you know, we gave up on chess. We're like, no, speed, computers have been this. Go, go is the magic special thing now. Uh, because it's way more complicated and computers will never get that and we should have learned. Um, so th earlier this year we set up Lee Sedol, the Korean Go Grandmaster, against uh, AlphaGo, the um, this system developed by Google, <coughs> which is a neural network, which plays in a very different way to how Deep O learned to play chess, which is that it, um, it didn't just look at the game board and go forward from it, it had studied the game. It had studied tens of thousands of games. It had learned actually how Go functions as a whole <coughs> system. And not only that, it had then played thousands and thousands of games against itself. They made two copies of it and got them to compete against each other. And its, go, and its ability to play the game just goes like this. 
Uh, it's full on kind of like war game stuff, if you've ever seen that. Um, and, uh, and this is something very strange because we understand how Deep Blue beat Kasparov. We understand the processes that occurred there. We don't understand how AlphaGo beat Lisa Doll because the processes by which it did it are contained within a neural network of such complexity that we simply can't understand it. That we don't actually have the ability to understand the way in which these machines functioned at this level. Uh, the classic example of this invisibility of these kind of systems, a simplistic example, um, is, is, a, is an example which is known in the literature for ages as detecting tanks. Uh, so this was an early neural network experiment by uh, the US Army where they, um, they wanted to build a neural network to detect tanks hidden among trees. Um, and uh, so they sent out an army unit with a tank to take a thousand photographs of a tank hidden among trees and a thousand pictures of the trees without any tank in them. And they trained the neural network on those images and it got really, really good. They could show any one of these 2,000 images and it would go, yes tank, no tank, yes tank, no tank. And the training set did that and they said, brilliant, okay. And they gave it, you know, the developers gave it to the rest of the army and went, here we built you this brilliant neural network. And they came back and were like, this doesn't work at all. They're like, what do you mean? It's like, no, like, uh, this thing is, uh, is worse than chance at detecting tanks from this new set of images we've got. And because it was a small set of images um, and, and it was a relatively constrained domain, uh, they figured out what was wrong, which is that the guys making the photos had only had the tank in the morning. Uh, so that all the images of, ta of the tank were in the morning and all the images of the, um, uh, without tank were in the afternoon and you could give this, Im this neural network any image at all and it would tell you whether it was taken in the morning or the afternoon. <laughs> That's what it had learned. Because it hadn't been given any other way of understanding the world. It was just given these sets of images. So it had done something very brilliant but we had no idea what it was doing because we don't understand exactly how these things learn. And these are the things that we're now you know, using for very large scale data problems. Um, like every tech company you know, every government you know is building stuff built on these, whether it's um, kind of social media companies or whether it's autonomous driving, for example, the next generation of Tesla's Uber drivers, all this kind of stuff is built in the same way. This is Google's latest one. Um, they trained three neural networks to, um, to develop their own form of encryption. They wanted to see if uh, neural networks without being taught about encryption could, uh, could develop their own systems of encryption and they successfully got two neural networks to design their own court code to talk to each other uh, in secret without a third neural network uh, being able to understand what they're saying or crucially I would add us uh, we just taught the machines to start speaking to each other without us having any idea what was going on and this seems to me this um, this seems to be a very important thing to address of how much we are capable of understanding about what is happening in the world and the various ways in which we are not capable of understanding everything and what we can, how we can live in a world in which that is increasingly apparent to us. Um, there are examples of this kind of stuff everywhere. Um, and the thing I mentioned earlier about opacity versus transparency seems to be an important example of it. Uh, we know that there's vast amounts of hidden classified information out there and our only response is um, to demand transparency, demand more of that information to be going back out to us. But yet, we, like, that is the same worldview, right? NSA and WikiLeaks have the same view of the world, which is that there is some secret information at the heart of the world that only if, if we can just bring that to light will sort of magically have this kind of incredibly, incredible overview of, of the world and we'll be able to make it better in some way. Um, this doesn't seem to be the way it works. Surveillance doesn't really function uh, as, as a kind of world mastering thing. Um, uh, there's many, many decent alternatives to way to control the world. But equally, the principle of transparency doesn't work either. None of us want to live in a world without privacy um, for, for anyone, really. Um, but also the, the ability to deal with the amount of information, as we've seen in recent WikiLeaks releases, doesn't really help the situation either. Um, <coughs> WikiLeaks is fairly obvious, uh, didn't exactly come down on the side of progress and justice in the recent US election uh, and did some pretty other awful things along the way because handling that much information is, is difficult and dangerous. That much information is frankly toxic. Like it's always going to do some kind of damage at some kind of level. At the same time, we have this kind of emerging crisis of um, uh, inability to model from the data. 
uh, again using the, the recent US election as an example, um, the major narrative around it is this complete shock and surprise is that no one seemed to know that this was going to happen. Um, that all of the models that we built uh, were insufficient to build uh, an understanding of, of, um, of kind of possible outcomes. Uh, that all of our, our prediction models based on years and years and years of previous data were completely insufficient for um, predicting uh, outcomes. Um, and this uh, this is particularly difficult when it's tied in with the wash of kind of fake news or uncertain news or the explosion of information available about the world um, because it's not just uh, an inability to predict it's also an ability to make kind of reasonable judgments about things um, this is a poll from the UK um, where basically um, this is back to the Brexit again which showed that um, Excuse me. Uh, up to a third of voters on both sides were convinced that the uh, referendum was going to be rigged. Uh, and this is, this is a theme you've heard again from the US elections. Um, in fact, you've heard all over that what you're having is a complete, trust, uh, complete collapse of trust in any institutions to be able to provide kind of useful information, while at the same time no uh, ability on people to be able to parse their own um, to make their own decisions about the quality of these in, this information. We've had kind of 20, 30 years of complete destruction of people's ability to trust in authority and institutions, and I'm all for getting rid of authority and institutions, uh, but it has to come with some form of literacy in able to, being able to make own collective decisions in response to the vast amount of information that we're gaining about this stuff. And yet that seems completely and utterly not to be the case. Um, this, uh, um, a complete kind of crisis of literacy has occurred in our ability to deal with large amounts of complex information. And you can see this at every scale, whether it's the kind of post-factual politics, the fake news, or it's at this much larger scale. I'm sure I speak for many of us when there was a kind of deep and certain belief that um, the internet was, and, and the kind of access to information it provided is kind of inherently and magically um, progressive, utopian, emancipatory. Um, and yet, that doesn't appear to be the case. Uh, we live in a world that is demonstrably, increasingly riven by divisive nationalisms, by fundamentalisms, um, by these kind of like deep societal divides that are, are, are being worsened by, uh, about, by sheer volumes of availability of information. That the um, increase of information alone doesn't, um, doesn't improve the situation, it actually seems to make it worse that people when presented with the grey zone, with a, a world of contradictions such as is presented to us by like, the clear view on the world that we actually have because of these network technologies. We now see more of anything that's going on than ever before and it turns out it's very hard to build models based on that because it's completely all over the place. The world is cloudy. It's not possible to build simple coherent narratives. So the narratives are getting worse, they're getting darker and they're getting scarier. They're getting more paranoid and they're getting more conservative. Um, because the more information people have, the more they want simple narratives to build up. Um, the final example of that um, is, I think for me as well, to come back to where we started, uh, climate change. Um, the one that kind of really kicked me in the gut the other week was a story about uh, turbulence. Uh, turbulence is on the increase in the atmosphere. Uh, plane rides are getting bumpier. Um, because the atmosphere is changing so fast um, that it's producing more and more wind shear between the different levels of the atmosphere. And this is increasingly measurable on passenger flights. Uh, uh, but uh, this rate of change is um, actually changing everything because the entire way in which we have of modelling the world has been based on years and years and years, decades if not centuries, of gathering information about the world in order to build meteorological and other models so that we can predict what the future was going to be. And that system is breaking down because of climate change. Because the weather is changing so fast, we can no longer predict what the weather is going to be. Which means we're actually going to be less able to prepare and deal with what it is going to bring. This seems to me to be like a, 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 a kind of ontological crisis that is related so closely to the information crisis um, that there must be some 
way of thinking through it that, that brings those things together. Um, that there must be another way of seeing the world and thinking it through that doesn't rely on this demand for information, this demand for prediction and control based on models, that admits that the world is cloudy and that allows us to accommodate ourselves with a form of unknowing. Um, and that's really what I, where, where I'll end, um, hopefully not having completely bummed you out, as I said, um, because I still believe that the, the tools that we build are, are inherently emancipatory in some way, if we can just figure them out. That we may have mistaken these technologies we've built for uh, tools of uh, direct knowledge, for tools of mastery and control, which they were never intended to be. Um, these technologies are products of cultures um, that are often contradictory, that are often paradoxical, are often more like literature uh, and art than, than at least bad science. Uh, and, and kind of weak technological control. That the internet remains um, a model of something. Uh, maybe not a complete system, but possibly a better model of the world than one we've ever built before, if we, if we take it at face value, if we, if we listen to the lessons that it's telling us about difference and strangeness in the world, uh, and actually start to build that into the way we, we think and relate to one another. Um, I'll stop there. Thank you very much. James, thank you for this beautiful talk. Uh, we can take some questions.